from the moment he drew his first breath until he limped into Egypt 130 years later. His life was filled with turbulence and struggle. He was called heel grabber, even though, because even though his twin Esau came out first, Jacob wanted to be first. So he reached out his wrinkled little hand and grabbed his brother's heel. His name also means deceiver or trickster because he did whatever was necessary to deceive, steal, trick, whatever he had to do to be first and to get what he wanted. Genesis laid out a long and twisted misadventure of Trickster and his hapless elder brother. Jacob plays Esau's plays to Esau's baser nature, tricking him into selling his birthright. Then Jacob deceived his own father and stole Esau's blessing, the blessing that was reserved for the eldest son. And his mom, Rebecca, was complicit with Jacob's deception. Here's how that played out. This is from Genesis chapter 27, starting in verse 11. Jacob said to Rebekah, his mother, But my brother Esau is a hairy man, and I am a smooth man. What if my father touches me? I would appear to, to him to be tricking him, and would bring down a curse on myself rather than a blessing. His mother said to him, My son, let the curse fall on me. Just do what I say. Go and get them for me. So he went and he got them and he brought them to his mother and she prepared some tasty food just the way his father likes it. Then Rebekah took the best clothes of Esau, her older son, which she had in the house, and she put them on her younger son, Jacob. She also covered his hands and the smooth part of, the, of his neck with the goat skins. Then she handed them to her son, handed to her son the tasty food and the bread that she had made. And the outcome was... He was able to steal his brother's blessing. Esau was understandably consumed with hatred for his younger brother. Verse 41 of chapter 27 says, Esau seethed in anger against Jacob because of the blessing his father had given to him. He brooded. This time for mourning my father's death is, is close. And then I will kill my brother Jacob. Rebekah overheard Esau's plan and sent Jacob to her brother's house. There, ever the golden child, Jacob met Rebekah, excuse me, Rachel, a stunning beauty who, who naturally would become his wife. I imagine even this galled Esau. Jacob tricked him out of his birthright, stole his blessing, gets to leave without paying the price for it, and he gets the girl. You know anyone like that? I want you to know that whatever's going on in your life, God has not turned a blind eye. He sees and he is working. If someone's like that to you, lead them in God's hands. Trust him. Don't become bitter. Don't become vengeful or jealous. My D group and I have been studying the, the New Testament. James chapter 5 encourages believers to treat everyone the same, whether they're wealthy or they're poor. And to actually pray for the wealthy because, well, in James' words, the wealth that, that can, can really be a source of freedom can also become bondage and do great harm to not only your life, but also to your soul. James chapter 5, the first three verses says this, Now listen, you rich people, weep and wail because of the misery that is coming upon you. Your wealth is rotted and moths have eaten your clothes. Your gold and silver are corroded. Their corrosion will testify against you and eat your flesh like fire. You have hoarded wealth in the last days. Well, then he gives some advice that we can apply to every situation where it seems like the wrong is being called right. The mean are winning out. The wicked are carrying the day. He says, be patient then, brothers and sisters until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the land to yield its valuable crop and how patient he is for the autumn and spring rains. You too be patient and stand firm because the Lord's coming is near. We can rest in God's goodness and his justice. We are all planting seeds and cultivating the field for harvest. And our Lord is coming soon to harvest, to receive that harvest. And he's working in each of our lives to produce the fruit that he desires. Jacob met Rachel, 
But in a stroke of irony, genius irony from God's perspective, he also met her father, Laban. The young deceiver had more than met his match. Jacob fell in love with Rachel and Laban was happy to have the free labor. It didn't take him long to realize that with him taking care of his flocks, God was blessing him and he was happy to have that blessing. He agreed to allow Jacob to marry Rachel, but on his wedding night, after plenty of partying and wine, Laban switched brides. And when Jacob woke the next morning, he rolled over and looked into the face of Leah. Now, as Jacob's life unfolds, we learn a lot more about Leah. She was a, a good woman, a godly woman, and all she really wanted was for her husband to love her. But deceivers only know how to look at the surface, and Leah did not meet the standard. We read this description of Leah in verse 17, chapter 19 in Genesis. Leah had weak eyes, but Rachel was lovely in form and beautiful. Rachel was the beauty queen, and Leah was the girl that, when you describe her, she's got a great personality. She's got pretty eyes. She did not really fit the bill from Jacob's perspective. But let me point something out here. Truly, the party went late into the night. Jacob had more than his fill of wine, but Leah and Laban had double teamed him, just like Jacob and Rachel had double teamed elderly, nearly blind Isaac. Leah probably borrowed some of Rachel's clothes. She did her best to look like her younger, shapelier sister in the dark of the bridal chamber while Laban distracted Jacob. The trap was sprung. The bell could not be unrung. The trickster had been tricked. Now, Jacob loved Rachel, and he had no choice but to extend his, his working commitment with Laban to another seven years so that he could earn the right to marry Rachel. But Laban was not done deceiving the deceiver. Laban came up with reason after reason for Jacob to stay so that he could continue caring for his flocks and bringing God's blessing. But realize, Jacob gave as well as he took. Laban changed Jacob's wages ten times in the course of six years. And each time he did, Jacob manipulated the market to his own advantage. Finally came to a breaking point. And like a thief, Jacob stole away with his wives, his servants, his 11 children, all of his livestock. Unfortunately, when Jacob left, he left as the same man as when he came. But God was not done. He loved Jacob and had designs on his life. Jacob was to be the father of God's people. Out of him would come the 12 tribes of Israel. But before God could bless him, God had to break him. As Jacob headed home, his brother's words rang in his ears. So soon I'll mourn my father's death. Then I'll deal with that trickster once and for all. Jacob, ever scheming to move everything to his advantage, sent all of his possessions, his wives, his servants, even his children and his livestock. He sent them all ahead and he stayed behind. Imagine the chill that must have run up Jacob's spine when he heard the words, Esau, your brother's coming, and he brought 400 friends. Jacob was alone with himself. When your life has been all about yourself and you've done everything you could to get what you want, no matter how it hurt other people, no matter who you hurt, To be alone with yourself is a fearful thing. And frankly, you're not in great company. But God was not done. He never leaves us. He never forsakes us, even though we feel like we might deserve it. Genesis chapter 32 recounts this situation. We read in Genesis 32, verses 22 to 31. So Jacob was left alone, and the man 
wrestled with him until daybreak. Some man showed up. He didn't know who he was. He was all by himself, brooding and, and being afraid. And we don't know what he was doing, but a man showed up and wrestled with him. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched and he was wrestled, and he, as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it's almost daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name? Jacob, he answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. At first sight, it seems as though this fight ends in a draw. Jacob asked for a blessing, and the man obliged. But the blessing demonstrated the man's authority over Jacob. Jacob had nothing left to give, so he looked to the man to bless him. And then the act of naming something or someone is an act of dominion. It's the reason God had Adam name all the animals, because he wanted mankind to exercise dominion. So in order for Jacob to receive his new name, the man asked for his current name. And here's the real point. In order for Jacob to become who he wasn't, he had to recognize and acknowledge who he was. He had to name himself. He had to, to, to own who he had been. So what does he say? My name is Trickster. I'm a deceiver. There he was, sweaty, torn clothes, hair disheveled, hanging his leg hanging off to the side, every ounce of strength drained from his body. God does not wrestle with us to put us down, to rub our noses in our failure, or to show us who's boss. He already knows who's boss, and so do we. He does not have to prove it. He wants us to willingly submit ourselves to his lordship. The man, we later find out, is the angel of the Lord. He is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus Christ. And he wanted Jacob to be totally spent with no other option but to call him, to, but to call out of him who he could be, who his potential was, who God knew was in him all along. You see, all his life, Jacob wanted to be blessed, but Esau was the eldest. He was going to receive the blessing no matter what it took, he would not take no for an answer. And it did not matter that he deceived his father, stole from his brother, and circumvented God's plan. He had the blessing, but a blessing stolen becomes gravel in your mouth. A blessing stolen causes you to spend your life looking over your shoulder, investing all your emotional energy, justifying your selfishness. Don't miss this. God took the initiative to engage Jacob. Jacob was alone. He had distanced himself from everything and everyone. But God showed up because he wanted Jacob to know that he was in this fight with him and he was not going to leave him alone, but he was in charge. Jacob let go of the stolen blessing finally understood that what he'd been searching for all his life was a blessing directly from God. And the one Jacob had been fighting all along was not Esau. It wasn't Isaac. It wasn't Laban. It was God himself. The blessing Jacob needed wouldn't come from a human. The blessing he needed most would come only from God himself. The angel calls Jacob Israel, which means he who struggles with God. Because in the words of the angel, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with men and have overcome. How had Jacob overcome? 
One translation says, uses the word prevailed. How had he prevailed? Did he win the match? No, he didn't win the match. The match could have been over in two seconds if God had chosen to dislocate his neck. I mean, God could have stopped this immediately. Jacob prevailed because he finally attained God's requirement to be in covenant with him. He stopped trying to steal it. He stopped trying to take it on his own, and he clung to God alone. He reached out to God and said, I'm not going to let go until you bless me. He finally looked to God, not himself, and not trying to trick someone else to receive a blessing that could only come from God. Do you want God's blessing? Cling to God alone. Don't look to your own strength. Don't scheme or try to get it from someone else. Hold on to God alone. But when you do, you better buckle up, buttercup, because the path to God's blessing lies on the other side of brokenness. God's subtle ways make me smile. As he ends this section, let me, let me refresh us on the last verse in verse 31. This is what he says. He says, The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. A new day had dawned for the one who had wrestled with God. He would walk the rest of his days with joy in his heart and a limp in his step. I like the way Tony Evans says it. When God is changing your character, it's going to hurt for a minute. Now, Paul kind of draws this to a focus for us and how this can apply to us. As we see his example, he says in 1 Corinthians chapter, 2 Corinthians, excuse me, chapter 1 and verse 8, he says, We do not want you to be uninformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the providence of, excuse me, the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. Indeed, in our hearts we felt the sentence of death. But this happened so that we might learn to rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. You see, God will bring difficult times in our lives, not because he, he's far from us or he, he's mad at us, but because he wants us to draw close to him so that we learn to rely on him and trust him in those difficult times. And what did that growth through brokenness do for Paul and his companions? It grew their faith. The next verse, verse 10 says, He has delivered us from every deadly peril, and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope, and, we, and, and he will continue to deliver, deliver us. And as we wrestle with God, he teaches us to rely on him, not on ourselves. In the process, and, and we get to know him more intimately, and we grow in our confidence that even when he chooses not to deliver us from the lion's mouth, he will deliver us safely and securely home. Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 4 as he's seeing his life coming to an end. He says, The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be, to the, be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Do you want to see God do his best work? Do you want to experience God's blessing in your life? Then pray this really dangerous prayer. God, break me. Let's pray together. Father, I want to thank you so much that you walk through us through difficult times, like the times we're experiencing right now in the United States, March 15th, 2020, as we are struggling with the pandemic, the worldwide pandemic of the coronavirus. We know that you are with us and we know that in a time like this, we can lean into you. We can rely on you. We know that you are with us through this. We surrender ourselves to you right now. We take our hands off the things that we want and we trust you. And we ask you, God, to work in our lives, to draw us close to you. We look for your blessing. We look for your presence. And we understand that it comes through hard times, through tests and trials, through brokenness. 
So we understand as well that we're really asking you to break us. We are in your hands and we ask you to do the work that only you can do. In Jesus' name, amen.